right. Hello, everyone. I am Claire Parsons, uh, the founder of the Brilliant Legal Mind blog. I'm a lawyer, a mindfulness teacher, an author, and a mental health advocate in the legal profession. Um, one of the things I like to do, in addition to talking about mindfulness on the blog, is also to share some stories of attorneys who have been willing to talk about their mental health. And one of the issues that I have been hearing a whole lot about lately and also experiencing somewhat in my own life um, with my loved ones is ADHD. Um, there are a lot of lawyers now talking in particular about adult diagnosis with ADHD, and many of us may have experienced some of the challenges um, uh, or seen loved ones experience the challenges with medication um, with the shortages that happened last year. Um, I started talking about some issues recently on um, one of the groups I was in uh, for lawyers, and Nicole Galley, who is with me today, thank you for being here, Nicole, um, mentioned that she had just um, experienced some issues relating to ADHD, and she was willing to talk to me about it. So I'm going to do an interview with Nicole to get her some of her story. So thanks for being here, Nicole. I really appreciate it. Thanks for having me. I appreciate you looking at the issue. Yeah. So first of all, I would like to um, introduce you to everyone. So can you tell me about yourself? And I really encourage you to just let everyone know just how impressive you are, because I know there's a tendency of many people to be humble, and I just don't think it is justified when looking at your bio. So can you tell us about yourself? Sure. I, thank you. Um, and you're right. It's hard to do that. But uh, so I've been practicing law for over 30 years. Um, it's you know, came straight through school. So I was an undergrad at the University of Pennsylvania, got my degree in medieval and Renaissance history, which is relevant. Um, I then stayed at Penn and got my law degree, graduated in 92, spent a few years um, with the firm of Dewey Valentine, which no longer exists. Uh, so, you know, big New York white shoe law firm, um, was there about four years, came to join Pepper Hamilton, which is also not exactly existing anymore. Now it's Trout and Pepper. Um, and I remained there for another 14 years. I was, uh, ultimately a partner there, um, left Pepper about 14 years ago, went to a couple of other firms, tried a small firm, tried a regional firm. And ultimately, just almost 10 years ago now, nine and a half years ago, I started my own woman-owned law firm. Um, and we have six going on seven attorneys, including myself. Um, and my practice area is primarily litigation um, and what large complex litigation. And in particular, I sort of stumbled into it while I was at Dewey Valentine, fell in love with it and have done it ever since. My focus is technical litigation. And what I mean by that is I deal with all kinds of cases that have either a scientific or a technical issue. And that typically, and for the first you know, 20 years or so of my practice was principally patent litigation. Um, I'm old enough that patent litigation was not a thing when I first started practicing. It was very rare, big firms didn't do it, as hard as that is to believe. Um, and about 10, 12 years ago, I started to get involved more in trade secret litigation. And I could really see this was before the DTSA, um, that that was kind of going to be the way things were going. I'm pretty good at predicting trends. Um, and what I love loved about both, or still love about both, is at the time I was doing patent litigation, there were a lot of unanswered questions in the law. Like, we didn't have a lot of the standards that are commonplace today. Like, there was no Markman. There were no patent rules. Um, a lot of the things that, that are just customary, we, we didn't know, and we're seeing that now, right? In trade secret litigation, there's a, a lot of questions that are not yet answered under, under the DTSA. So I like really complicated legal problems, but then I also love really complex technical issues. Um, and I highlighted that I was a medieval and Renaissance history major because I did not have a single qualifying credit that would have allowed me to stay sit for the patent bar. So I come at technical litigation with a, a questioning mind, open perspective, and no preconceived notions whatsoever. And probably one of the nicest things anyone's ever said to me professionally was we did a two-week jury trial in a very complicated trade secret case that involved algorithmic trading, so big computer, big data trading, 
in the wholesale electricity market, which is a very complicated market. And, and so you have to learn both about like computers and algorithms and how, you know, you know, data analysis and, you know, machine learning, all that kind of stuff works. And you had to understand the flow of electricity and how electricity is delivered <laughs> within the wholesale market. Um, I was questioning the, um, what the chief technical witness on the other side who had not one, but two PhDs, um, including one was from the MIT of China. And um, my client wrote a note to my co-counsel, who is my husband, um, we were law school classmates and said, I think she understands this stuff better than he does. Um, and that right there in some ways is my ADHD, right? Like I love doing a deep dive on something complicated, something difficult, something I don't know and learning everything I can about it. Um, and I also love solving really complicated problems. Like here's a legal question, what's the answer? I don't know, what should the answer be? <laughs> you know, one of the hardest things I did, I took the Delaware bar after 20 years of practice, long story, I'm, I'm a member. Um, and I remember struggling on so many, and this was true even as a kid, frankly, so many of the multiple choice questions. I can't do multiple choice. It's like, but wait, what about this? What about that? What should the answer be? You know, and one of them was like, you know, would this something or other happen in front of the jury or outside the jury? I'm like, I don't know. It depends. What do you want the answer to be? And who's the judge? You know, I'm sure there's a rule on this, but it doesn't necessarily matter. We can make an argument. Um, so, you know, that that's the good part, I suppose, is that, you know, I can do lots of really hard things and really fun things. Um, the bad part, oh, there's other bad parts, right, is it's exhausting, you know, that kind of thing. And we can talk and about those in a minute. Yeah. And that's my next question. You're, you're anticipating me a little bit. Um, so, you know, I, it sounds like, you know, obviously you're a magician in terms of your law practice and you do a lot of really technical, hard, challenging things and you've had some success with it. But um, the reason you said you wanted to talk about this is because you said you were diagnosed with ADHD as an adult um, and it just kind of shaped your experience. And so without getting too much into, you know, prying into any personal things, can you share like what some of the problems were, or issues were that alerted you that maybe you need to investigate this further or get some more support? So I wish I could say that it was like recognizing problem and this is a potential solution because that's not really what happened. You know, lifelong, anyone who knows me knows I'm, very much have a hard time being on time. I was born late. That's I was 10. I was, I was a month late. I mean, like, you know, I, I have very much a lot of trouble with that. Um, folks with ADHD, you will totally feel this. I have time blindness. There is now and not now. I have no idea how long things take. None whatsoever. You know, I mean, I do certain things. I can budget really well for clients because I know technically how long a project should take. But when I start something, like I'll go down a rabbit hole and I'll be like, oh, this is interesting. I'm going to go learn more about this thing. You know, um, I mean, just you name it. I'm like, I hmm, wonder what the answer is there. And, you know, 20 minutes later, I've like gone down some rabbit hole that I never intended to be there. Um, so, you know, that that was an issue. And then the the one thing I will say, so I was diagnosed with depression and this is another thing we need to talk about as, as a profession because Lord knows there's many of us. Um, yeah. I was diagnosed with depression 25 years ago and I've only started talking about it publicly now, right? It was like gonna be the death knell, I think, to my career had I ever said that, right? And it was pretty bad. Like it was a bad depression. I was functional, but it would take me three hours to get out of bed in the morning, which to me, I didn't even notice, you know? Um, so, and, and there are times that life was just really hard. It was exhausting. It was overwhelming. I have two kids. I'm a really devoted mom. Um, I have four pet, four, well, four cats, a dog. I mean, I have a lot going on my plate <laughs> and a husband. Uh, you know, I get involved in all kinds of activities. I've started and grown two organizations. I just run stuff. Right. So. I, I have all these, I have always had multiple balls in the air. I can't not have many balls in the air. So it's understandable that I'm tired, but this was a, a level of bone tired that I 
that only somebody I think with ADHD would get where it's like a total overwhelm and shutdown. And there would just be days where it's like, oh my God, I just need a moment. Right. And I just would need to like, you know, that's it. We're not doing anything right now, you know, and that was just life. Um, and I, I, for a long time ascribed it to the depression. And I think that was a piece of it retrospect. Maybe it was undiagnosed ADHD, who the hell knows. Um, but, and it would come and go, like, it wasn't always like that, but I was always doing a ton. Right. So it's kind of hard to say. Um, and the other thing that was like very hard running a household, I've always had inordinate amounts of household help and always as a working mom felt guilty about that because they like to make working moms feel guilty for having help. It's okay if dads do, but moms can't. And especially, you know, like, you know, it, it's just ridiculous, but I always had to have tons and tons of help. And it was still difficult, like trying to get dinner on the table, especially once my kids were older and teenagers, they're, they're 20 and 17. Now we didn't have as much help and, you know, it didn't feel justified. Um, but I had a really wonderful business coach who I still work with. She's amazing. Leslie Hassler, adore Leslie. Um, and she was one who said to me, this was before I think the ADHD diagnosis. She's like, do you like doing this household stuff? And I'm like, no, not really. No, kind of don't. Like I like to cook when I feel like cooking, but no, I don't want to cook every day. It's a thankless job. She's like, then why are you doing it? I'm like, good question. So we actually, I actually have full-time help at home and because otherwise it would be a complete shit show in my house, you know, and, and that, so, so those, I say these things, cause this is what you're, you know, on the outside, I have all my shit together. I do loads of stuff. I've been very successful professionally. I do a ton of things outside of my actual job. Um, do great work for my clients, have a big team, you know, you name it. I look like, you know, the poster child, you know, two really happy kids who are doing well, like it's the poster child for success. But like in my house, it can be a bit of a train wreck. Um, so long story short, my daughter was, again, being evaluated for ADHD. She, we, she should have been diagnosed with this in second grade when her teacher first said maybe she has it. But of course, they just said it was anxiety, um, which it probably was as well. And I was kind of going to sessions with her. This was in her senior year of high school. And listening to things she was saying, and one of the things that most resonated was talking about how hard it was to do everything that she did every day. And she did an amazing amount, you know, fruit doesn't fall far from the tree. And, and the psychologist was like, you know, that level of exhaustion, that's not, that's not typical. That's not like the way life should be. And that was stunning to me. And that was the moment when I'm like, really? I just figured it was because we were doing so much stuff. You know, I didn't think that could be not normal. Um, and so I started doing a bunch of research and I work with her and it like, I don't know, three years ago. So I'm 56 now. So I got diagnosed, uh, went on Concerta and the exhaustion I'd say is the biggest thing that has lifted. Um, it's not as hard to get from point A to point B in the day as it used to be. And that was the biggest thing, you know, and I tried every mindfulness thing there is. And number one, I couldn't stick to it because it was boring to me. Um, probably shouldn't say that, <laughs> but it is. And, and it, and it just didn't quote solve the problem. It, and mindfulness can be hard. There's, there's some challenges with it, but you ever want resources or want to talk about that? <laughs> I think like, I probably read them all. <laughs> the, the thing is like a lot of people learn mindfulness on their own or from an app and have no community around it, no teacher. Mm -hmm. And yeah, that's going to be really hard. You know, that's, that's like trying to learn fitness entirely on your own or with yeah. no prior experience. I mean, that is hard. And that's, that is what I'm partly trying to change. Um, so in terms of, I think you kind of answered my next question about the impact of the diagnosis, but I'm going to skip to the next one. Um, what is the most important thing that like you wish the legal profession understood about mental health or ADHD? Um, you can answer that, you know, however, however you like. I would say for both, cause it applies to both, you know, ADHD, any kind of neurodivergence, frankly, or, you know depression or other things just because individuals might have a condition that fits in one of the categories we mentioned doesn't mean they're not successful doesn't mean they're not competent 
doesn't mean they're not valued contributors, doesn't mean that there isn't a role for them to play. It may mean that they need accommodations, they need understanding, they need support, they need a workplace that tolerates difference and actually celebrates it. You know, and and if we're not as a profession, you know, valuing people for what they bring to the table and instead trying to keep putting people into certain rigid boxes, which I think it does, and that's why I'm an entrepreneur, you know, and have like set sets of expectations on people, um, you know, then we're losing out. I mean, there's incredible talent out there. And I think, you know, and, and we're making people miserable and, and we're really hurting people. Like we are literally as a profession, burning people out and hurting them. Like that's not okay. It's not healthy. It's not okay. And so I think we really, I mean, you know, my philosophy and I heard another like big firm say this and I'm like, mm, skeptical, but my philosophy is you have to put people first. We're the product, right? You have to treat your product well. Like if you want to just put it in the most, you know, crudest term as a business owner, like you, you got to value the people without the people, we don't have anything, you know? So, and that's not the way our model is set up. It's just not. Well, in, in, in one thing I'll say is, I, I mean, I've seen some variation across firms and I know that there can be some difference and cause I've been at small firms and now I'm at a much bigger firm. Um, and um, so there can be difference in scale. So one thing I would ask is, uh, you're, I know as you're, you've got a, your own firm now and you've got the ability kind of to do things your way. And I know you've been successful with it um, and have some great people there. So are there any like practices that, that you do that you think are particularly supportive in terms of like putting people first, like putting some teeth behind that idea of putting yeah. people first? I, I mean- so I think you, I think it's really, first of all, fundamentally starting from a different mindset, different mindset. Like I assume that people want to contribute and do a good job, right? I assume, but I also know that life happens and, you know, and, and so honestly, I mean, like things that make me crazy as a, as a business owner is when my employees thank me for letting them take time off when they're sick. I'm like, that's not, that like should not be something that they feel they have to do. Right. And, and I'm like, you know, that you don't have to thank me for that. They're like, yeah, but in my prior job, I'm like, so it, but I, and I know where they're coming from. I mean, I know, you know, like, I have horror stories from being a young attorney. You know, my, my dad was dying and I got a nasty review because I literally left fully informing the partner as to what was going on, you know, and telling him ahead of time, I didn't think I could finish the project because of what was going on and took the project as far as I could. And it was perfectly fine. There were other people to help. And I got a bad review because I left and went to my father's deathbed. I'm not even making that up. That's like a true story. And I mean, really, you know, he died three days later and, and literally got a bad review for that reason. And the partner's like, well, my, my mom died when I was young. So she, I know she should have done something differently, you know? Wow. I mean, it's not even made up, right? <laughs> like, yeah. So it's really kind of a low bar, you know, it's a little bit of empathy, you know, the golden rule do unto others, like you'd like them to do to you. Like it's, it's really like, honestly, in my experience, it's really kind of a low bar. Just, just don't be an asshole. I mean, like, you know, and then beyond that, you know, put, like literally support people. I mean, if people, you know, invest in people, help people figure out where people's strengths are, play to their strengths. I mean, it's just team 101. Like it's not, people do this in business all the time. I don't know why we can't do it in law. Be a good human and a good leader. Um, it's, a, it's a good recipe for organizations. So um, in terms of like resources or any kind of supports, like, is there anything that you can point to that was particularly helpful to you? You mentioned your coach and that's a great one, but like any books, any kind of, um, resources? I mean, I read cause you know, ADHD, I read everything there was to read in a book. Um, I think f whether it was a general ADHD book, um, or, or for women, I listened to bajillion blogs. Um, 
I mean, there's a lot of material out there. I think everything is written from a certain perspective. And so it's, to me, what was useful was reading a lot, right? Um, probably the thing I think I found most valuable is a couple of, of Facebook groups, actually, with women lawyers. And like, you know, not because I'm necessarily getting tips or resources from it. Like I learned a lot of coping skills, <laughs> you know, the medication kind of fixed what the coping skills weren't working. Um, but just more knowing I'm not alone. Right. And, you know, and so, you know, and just seeing sometimes the post and being like, oh yeah, feel that, <laughs> you know, like just knowing that it's like, it's normal, right. Like having that sense of like, you know, this is okay. We can do this and be successful. And, you know, it does, it, it's, it's okay. Um, so for me, that's actually been the most, like there's one like squirrels or something. I like for real, that's the title. Um, if you can send me any of the links, I'll, yeah, I'll have to like go on Facebook and see what they are and I'll let yeah, you know, yeah. but, uh, I mean, it's, it's just really great. Like, and I am so grateful to the, the women attorneys who run the group. I mean, they do it as a labor of love, you know, and like, I know they have like a discord where people do body doubling and stuff like that. I, I haven't needed those resources. So, I mean, there's a lot out there. Um, but you know, I think that's the only thing I currently do to just kind of have that, like, nope, you're good. Not the only one, totally fine. You know, or like the, the other one the other day that really resonated was like, yeah, I spent like, you know, 20 minutes looking for like, uh, I forget what it was. I think it was her bra, but she was wearing it. I mean, like, you know, like, I'm sorry, like, that's not crazy, but like, it's funny, not funny, you know? And, and I mean, that hasn't been me, but I've had other things like that. You know, just being able to laugh at yourself and not take it too seriously. So Nicole, um, last question. Um, and uh, part of what I am doing with this series um, is is trying to help lawyers, you know, feel a little bit more like not necessarily that they can go tell the world about their mental health condition or what's going no, on. No, because unfortunately, I still think there's a yeah, lot. Well, of but but that they problems. at least tell someone, right? That they can at least talk to someone and get some help. And so the question I want to ask is, and I think a lot of people are afraid to do that. And I know certainly I was before I started doing all this. Um, but why did you agree to participate in this interview? Why was it important to you to, to share your experience with ADHD and mental health um, in the profession? Somebody needs to speak out. And I'm, I'm part of me is still like, how are my clients going to take this? You know, how, I mean, I still have people I answer to, um, but but if somebody doesn't, I mean, this has always been me. If somebody doesn't speak out, who's going, you know, and if it's not me, who, then who, right? Um, somebody has to change the narrative. Somebody has to speak out. And that's, a, that's a role that I'm always been very comfortable with. And, you know, per, probably again, ADHD. Um, but, and also because I think it's really important to change stereotypes too. Um, you know, I, similar to why I started Women on Law, the organization I founded, God, could be 10 years ago now, for women entrepreneurs in the law. Um, women entrepreneurs in the law were seen as failures. You know, oh, you couldn't cut it. He you try to run a business, honey. Um, you know, and it, it is not for the faint of heart. And I've never worked this hard in my whole life as I have, and my kids will tell you that, till I started my firm. I've never, had, it's been the most rewarding thing I've done. But But the point I'm making is, you know, we need to change the stereotype. People with ADHD, people with other types of neurodivergence are not failures. We can be successful. You know, we just do it differently and differently is okay. And that's that to me is the biggest thing. We talked about this before you started recording. Difference is not bad. And, and I think inherently as lawyers, as a profession, we get anxious when things are different and don't fit a mold partially because of what we do, right? We have to follow rules, but, you know, whether it's because I'm a woman, whether, you know, it's because I'm, I have neurodivergence, whether, you know, it's someone who's of color, someone who's LGBTQ, somebody who's different for any reason, first generation, different culture, difference is scary to people. And when things are scary, they try to tamp it down and stop it. But difference is not just okay, it's really good. And it strengthens us and it would strengthen us as a profession. And so, I don't know, trying to do my part.
Well, I think that's a great answer. Um, and I really appreciate you being here, Nicole, and chatting with me. And thanks to everyone for being here. Thank you.